let me present Professor Robert Hartwig from the University of South Carolina, who's going to talk about uh, the impact of COVID-19 disruptions on the workers' compensation line. Thank you, John. <laughs> John, I don't know if you could hear that. John told me to break a leg. Um, I'm not sure that's a, a way to start a workers' comp conference, but uh, uh, at, at any rate, I'll try to for, ignore his advice there for the beginning. I, I always try to impress upon my students when I, I do talk about workers' compensation. Uh, uh, they don't really totally understand what a no-fault system is, and I told them if I do a cartwheel uh, right here in the classroom and, and break my head open, um, it would be covered under workers' comp uh, under the state of South Carolina because it would be work-related. Um, they don't, and so the students are very uh, clever at trying to come up with ways to think about, well, would this be covered? Would that be covered? Who knows? Um, but I, um, I, it is very much my pleasure to be here, and um, uh, it is good to be back again in front of crowds. I've actually done quite a few in-person events uh, so far this year, but they've all been in an arc from Arizona to Texas to Florida and other pl in Georgia and other places in the southeast, so it's good uh, to be back here in the northeast uh, here in Massachusetts, which actually happens to be my home state. I grew up about 50 miles out near the Worcester area here. But um, without any further ado, uh, there is a lot that's been going on over the past two years. And when John asked me to uh, talk uh, at this conference, probably last November, uh, and that the theme would be related to disruption, I don't think John had any idea about how much additional disruption was going to continue uh, between the time he asked me to come and, uh, and what's been going on uh, since then, especially the last uh, couple of weeks. And that will factor very much into what I discuss uh, today because it's going to very much influence the trajectory of not only the workers' compensation line, but the economy here in the United States and, in fact, uh, globally in the entire PNC insurance world. So, uh, just uh, so you know, I'll just uh, go over a few things here um, in this outline form. Uh, we'll be talking, of course, about inflation everywhere all the time. Everyone's talking about inflation. We'll talk about how that's likely to uh, filter in and impact uh, the workers' compensation world uh, through the world of labor markets and in other areas uh, as well. Uh, and we'll spend a fair amount of time on that. Uh, I think I would be derelict if I did not specifically address the issue of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what, uh, how that has changed the economic landscape of this country and, in fact, the world within just a couple of weeks. Uh, when we think about, again, what might happen to inflation, we're talking about in the increased probability of a recession now, the increased urgency of the Federal Reserve to try to contain inflation through raising interest rates. And then we'll talk about uh, many of the things that have happened to the labor force over the past two years. Uh, two years ago, uh, in, in February, two years ago, the unemployment rate was 3.5%. Within 60 days of that, it was about 15%. Truly extraordinary. And I think the labor market uh, situation has unfolded in a way that we really could not uh, have foreseen. <clears throat> we'll talk about the economy and how workers' comp will be impacted. A little bit about the industry overall in which workers' comp um, uh, lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and then COVID and workers' comp, of course. And at the end, we'll have some time uh, for some Q&A. So be thinking about those questions. Be very, very happy to answer them. So without any further ado, let me get right into it. Uh, you, can't, uh, you, you really can't turn on the television today or listen to anything without hearing about inflation. Inflation is running at a 40-year high right now. And uh, where is that rooted? Originally, it was rooted in the supply chain disruptions associated with the pandemic. Uh, it was rooted in uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, and it was rooted in uh, a variety of other things, and most recently now geopolitical turmoil. If we look at the expectations for inflation today, uh, during the pandemic, inflation actually fell to about 1.2%. Uh, that was below the Federal Reserve's uh, target of about 2%. Well, we were at 4.7% last year, and on an annual basis, uh, we're expected to be at about 7.5% uh, this year. Now, in just a span of three weeks, inflationary expectations for this year went from 5.5% to 7.5%. Okay, very, very rapid indeed. The expectation is that uh, inflation will decrease, decelerate to about 2.6% uh, next year. The idea is, is that once we get past uh, 
uh, this hundred dollar a barrel oil and so forth, uh, we will wind up in a much more stable situation. We'll have some unkinking of the supply chains and ultimately uh, we'll get closer to where we want to be in terms of inflation. The Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates and in fact uh, that's expected to begin literally today. Today is the first day of the rate tightening cycle for the, uh, for the Federal Reserve. Now, I never before would have imagined showing a picture of crude oil prices at a workers' comp conference, okay? Um, but ultimately, this is one of the major drivers of inflation, of course, uh, today, the acceleration of inflation. Uh, again, when John and I spoke a number of months ago, it was primarily associated with supply chain disruptions and so forth. Uh, but with the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, we have uh, oil over $100 a barrel last week. In fact, however, today it's dropped below uh, $100 uh, a barrel again. In fact, it's down by about a third uh, over the past several days. So expect all these kinds of oscillations. But the reality of it is, is whether it's oil or whether it's commodities, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the markets, and this is ultimately uh, fueling uh, inf inflationary fears. Um, Prior to, uh, you know, prior to the Ukraine crisis and so forth, we had a lot of other uh, reasons why uh, inflation was rising and why it was accelerating. If we go back to the very early days of COVID, uh, we had the beginning of what wound up being six COVID-19 stimulus packages. The first one was actually on March 6th of 2020. The second on March 18th, these were small uh, potatoes. And then uh, by the end of March, we had a third uh, $2.2 trillion, the CARES package that you might be familiar with, and a variety of other things that went through March of 2021. So basically, uh, we took um, uh, about $6 trillion and dumped it on the American people and dumped it on small businesses all across America. We told people to stay at home for the most part, and we told them they couldn't spend money on services. So people did what Americans know what they do. They sat down on their computers, went on Amazon, and bought everything they could possibly find. Okay, and we're surprised there's inflation. Okay, uh, this is I, so. I think the people who are least surprised that there's inflation on this planet are economists. Uh, this and the easy monetary policy, low interest rates, the Federal Reserve. Uh, buying trillions of dollars of, of assets uh, were all right out of the textbook of how you start inflation and start it quickly. Of course, uh, we had to be very concerned about the economy falling off a cliff. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the, the, the fire escaped and um, we're having to deal with that right now. If we look at the most recent numbers for inflation, uh, <clears throat> what's leading the way? Uh, things like used trucks and cars, gasoline, energy, electricity, food, shelter. Okay, these sorts of things. I put medical care in here not leading the way. Okay, so very, very concerned about the cost of medical care and workers' comp and elsewhere in the property casualty insurance world. So right now, the cost of medical care, in fact, the cost of services in general, the price increases in services in general are lagging behind uh, goods, energy, shelter, uh, those sorts of things. So if you don't need to buy a truck, use gas, or turn on the lights in your house. You don't have to worry about inflation too much, okay? Uh, but it is a problem, obviously, uh, for most people, but it affects others more than others, uh, more than other people, as inflation always will. And in fact, in this industry, uh, the property casualty insurance world, other segments are being much more affected. Uh, next week, I'll be testifying at a hearing in Georgia uh, on auto insurance rates, uh, where the issue is that uh, rates in general in personal lines of insurance are becoming inadequate because of the inability uh, to pass through rate in a way uh, that is commensurate with the underlying inflationary trends that insurers are seeing, such as if you have to repair cars or replace cars, uh, for instance. Now, the inflation rate over long periods of time, we've heard a lot of analogies that, you know what, uh, the times haven't been as bad as this since the early 1980s. Okay, so I think the analogies to the 1980s are very superficial. Um, <clears throat> uh, if, uh, if you were an adult in 1980, you would have readily traded uh, uh, 2022 for 1980. And I'll show you why in a couple of minutes. So first of all, in 1980, uh, the inflation, inflation peaked at 13.5% in 1980. Okay, we're expecting an inflation rate to peak somewhere around 7.9% maybe during this cycle. Uh, we'll see on a monthly basis uh, and 7.5% on an annual basis uh, for, for this year. Uh, so 
Uh, and you see inflation remained elevated for a very long period of time. And this has happened at other periods of time as well, not long after World War II, uh, during the Korean War, and again, uh, you know, 1970s, uh, 1975, when uh, we had uh, oil embargoes and so forth during that period of time. So what if on the same chart now I have uh, I, I add the unemployment rate. So I have inflation and unemployment, 1948 uh, to 2022. All right, so we've got almost, uh, we've got about 75 years worth of history here. And so you see those peaks in inflation, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and now in green you see the unemployment rate. If you look at the unemployment rate on the right-hand side, it's very, very low, whereas in the early 1980s, late 1970s, the unemployment rate was very, very high. That is one of the, the very large differences between today and, uh, and back in the early 1980s. So today, unemployment rate this year is actually expected to come in at 3.6%, 7.5% uh, for the entire year for inflation. Uh, the unemployment rate was 7.2%, double what it is today back in 1980, and inflation was nearly double what it is. So uh, a lot of problems uh, back then, and they lasted for many years. So the analogy isn't very good. So if I add the unemployment rate to the inflation rate, we get what economists call the misery index. Okay, this is an old measure that used to be uh, popularized back when inflation and unemployment were both very high. If I add those together, what do we have? Uh, we have a misery index reading today, this year, of 11.1. Uh, in 1980, it peaked at 20.7. So I have ascertained by the power invested in me that the most miserable decade ever in the post-World War II era was the decade not that we are in today, but in fact from 1974 to 1983. So that's when the average of the unemployment rate plus the, uh, plus the inflation rate was the highest. Okay? Uh, so the misery index there was 15.9 during that period of time. By the way, uh, if you're old enough uh, to have been in the market for a home, in 1980, you would have paid 18.1% for a 30-year mortgage. If you were in the market for a 30-year mortgage last month, it was 3.9%. Talk about misery, okay? So there are huge differences between then and now. So I think a lot of the analogies that times have never been worse than they are today are completely false. It's a misreading and a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation uh, of history. Um, in terms of inflation today, what, again, to, to kind of dissect it a little bit more and to see how this intersects with the economy, labor markets, and workers' comp, I mean, you know, if we take a look at this, what do you see here? This is the consumer price, you know, what we're dissecting here is the, uh, we're looking at the annual change, uh, the month-to-month -month change and the year-over year -over change in the consumer price index. So if we look at things um, kind of on a 12-month rolling, a month-to-month -month basis, you could see in, in the red bar here, we have pretty substantial increases on a month-to-month -month basis recently. And a year-over-year -year basis, in January we had inflation up 7.5%, in February it was 7.9%. So we are probably uh, reaching a peak in the current inflation cycle. Where is that inflation coming from? This shows that it's coming from primarily uh, uh, energy, it's coming from food, it's coming from uh, core uh, goods, uh, which is what you see in red here. The core goods is everything except food and energy. Uh, where it's not coming from too much right now is that gray area, which is services, which includes things like medical care, all right? That is yet to come. So if you go to the right of the dotted line, what we're expecting is that inflation in the services sector, including for medical services and so on, is likely to grow. It tends to be kind of a, a lagging indicator of, of inflation. So to the extent that we see pressure uh, building in terms of medical cost severities and workers' comp, that's likely to be more of a later 2022 into 2023 thing as we see cost increases work their way into wages in particular. And so what you see here is another illustration of this is you can see goods-related inflation off the charts uh, in the most recent data, about 12.3% uh, in the first quarter of this year versus 4.4% uh, for services. And again, it's services including uh, medical. Now, another thing right now is this may astound many people in the room, uh, but believe it or not, the, the, the influence of medical services on the overall rate of inflation in the U.S. is actually diminishing. Why is it diminishing? Uh, 
It's because other things are growing much more rapidly. Not that the cost of health care isn't rising, but if you've paid attention recently to what's happening to the price of housing, the price of rent, okay, uh, which has reached all-time record highs, more recently joined by such things as the, uh, the, uh, the price of energy, of course, that we've already discussed, and the price of something like new vehicles, um, <clears throat> medical, the increase in the cost of medical services in the most recent data is, n is not really contributing at all in any meaningful way to the current inflation rate. That is likely to change as we move later into this year and into 2023. So uh, it'll be interesting to monitor that uh, over time. How much additional pressure will we see as inflation eventually infiltrates uh, the service sector, including the healthcare sector? Uh, now, <clears throat> if we look at um, the overall consumer price index versus a medical cost inflation, so this is the medical cost component of the consumer price index uh, being shown in blue. And I could show this going all the way back 50 years. And what you would see is that in most years, the cost of uh, medical services, all things related to health care, rises at a pace much faster uh, than does the overall rate of inflation. In fact, between 1995 and 2021, it's a full point faster. But uh, things are changing right here recently. You can see that the, in red, the CPI for all items is much higher uh, the last few years uh, than it has been for uh, medical-related uh, items. And in fact, if I look on a month-to-month -month basis since the beginning of COVID, what I see is that the change in the, in, in, in the medical component of the consumer price index in blue, okay, as normal, uh, it starts out above the overall rate of inflation, and then it crosses over in early 2021, and you could see uh, the price of um, all items, the, the consumer price index, the general rate of inflation in red, skyrocketing, and <clears throat> what you see is a very modest increase or acceleration in, uh, in, in medical inflation uh, over the past year or so. So I think that chart really, really illustrates what's going on here today. And so over the past 12 months or so, we have the overall rate of inflation increasing at about five times the pace of healthcare. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's another point in history I could point to you uh, where that has happened. All right, now looking at some of the, the, the great work that's been done, been done by uh, WCRI here, uh, <clears throat> looking at uh, uh, their uh, index um, for uh, professional services, uh, comparing fee states with, uh, with non-fee states, uh, as you'd expect over the past 12 years or so, what you see, and so these data go through uh, 2020, you see very, very uh, modest increase uh, with uh, those states with fee schedules, and you see uh, those states um, in the top line that don't have fee schedules, you see those costs rising um, at a much more rapid pace. So the index value increases by 38% since 2008 to 2020. Those states without a fee schedule, only 8% of those uh, that do. And if you kind of disaggregate this a little bit, the spaghetti chart, uh, you see that uh, the states with fee schedules um, are... The, uh, the, the, the thin line, the purple line, and the, uh, the pinkish kind of line, the thick line, you see those tend to be rising. Uh, those are up near the top. Those are the states without the fee schedules. So uh, it makes, uh, makes a huge difference on the rate of inflation that see, we see for professional services within this particular uh, segment um, of, of the industry. It makes an absolutely uh, huge, uh, huge difference. Now... Uh, I wanted to address uh, this, this Russian invasion of Ukraine issue uh, very quickly. It's kind of the, uh, you know, it's, the, the, it's an important issue because it does change the trajectory of economic growth, uh, not only uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, but here, in fact, uh, in the United States. There are many potential implications uh, for the insurance industry. Number one is going to be the intensification of inflationary pressures. Uh, we've, uh, the Federal Reserve likes to keep inflation around 2%. There's a concern that, uh, that, that the expectation we have uh, among the citizens of the United States, among business leaders, uh, and within government, uh, that inflationary expectations of 2% are becoming unanchored, as economists say. In other words, that they're shifting from 2% to maybe something like closer to 3%. Um, and that means um, something very, very different for, uh, for, for growth and, and how we approach uh, 
uh, monetary policy and interest rate and so forth in the future. Um, commodities, goods prices, wages are rising, services will follow like medical care. It's somewhat inevitable. It also means there's going to be a slowdown in the U.S. Uh, economy. Uh, it's just, it's simply inevitable uh, that that is going, uh, uh, going to happen. Uh, we measure growth in terms of real, in other words, inflation-adjusted growth. So higher inflation automatically will take a toll. And then with higher energy prices, it essentially acts like a tax uh, on the economy, sapping disposable income. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest changes now is the probability of recession is increasing. Okay, that is one of the biggest uh, issues that we have right now. Uh, we have the combination of accelerating inflation, uh, we have high energy prices, uh, which in the past has led uh, to inflations, uh, has, has led to recessions uh, in the United States. And so um, you'll see a number of different projections out there, uh, but uh, major banks like Goldman Sachs and so forth um, are projecting uh, now about a 20 to 25 percent that the U 20 to 25 percent chance that the U.S. enters a recession over the next 12 months. That's up from seven to eight uh, percent that we saw in uh, that was projected in late 2021. That is a material increase. Okay, that's a material increase, and that has huge impacts for labor markets, and that means it has huge impacts for workers' compensation. Uh, now, um, right, so the odds are still more likely that we will avoid a recession, but there's no question that uh, the economy is, is likely going to s slow down, and that's something that the Federal Reserve wants. The Federal Reserve needs to engineer a slow down the economy without tipping it into recession. That's trying to, th like, thread a needle, and that's very, very challenging uh, for Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Increased threat of such things as cyber attacks it could be potentially very disruptive. We've had a huge amount of volatility in the investment um, markets, and insurers are some of the biggest institutional investors in the world. That's a huge thing. Uh, and so asset values, we've seen them uh, uh, decline, generally speaking, and... Um, uh, we're looking at, again, a change in the timing, magnitude, and pace of Federal Reserve rate hikes. And I said the first one is scheduled for today. Today is the day. You will hear an announcement by the end of the day today that the, we're raising interest rates for the first time uh, since they were lowered to nearly zero at the beginning of the pandemic. And another issue for insurers, of course, is whether or not uh, rates will become inadequate. This is a, uh, and ultimately, if inflation persists, whether or not reserves which is a big issue uh, in long-tailed lines like workers' compensation, whether they can maintain adequacy in an inflationary environment. We had a problem with that back in the 1970s, quite frankly. Uh, and so it's difficult for insurers to keep up uh, because there's a recognition lag in terms of collecting the data, analyzing the data, passing through the rates to customers. It takes a long time. So insurers uh, run the risk of getting behind the curve, both in, uh, particularly in terms of rates and potentially, ultimately, in terms of uh, uh, reserve adequacy. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, literally in the last 30 days, uh, we've seen the expectation for inflation in the U.S. go from 5.5% to 7.5%. This is entirely due uh, to the economic consequences of the invasion. Uh, we've seen uh, real GDP growth grow from expectations from 3.4% to 3% this year. Uh, these are material changes. So sustained higher prices for, uh, for energy, uh, is going to lead to slower GDP growth uh, and, and higher inflation. These are both negatives for the entire economy and the property casualty insurance industry and the workers' compensation line uh, as well. Uh, we are very much in this, this line, probably no line is more joined at the hip uh, with the overall economy than is workers' compensation almost by definition. So the risk of recession is increasing. That's one of the biggest takeaways from, or the changes from when John spoke to me about four or five months ago uh, to what's happened within just the past couple of weeks. And a risk of recession automatically means unemployment rates go up. Okay? Uh, and that means a reduction in workers' comp payroll exposure base, or at least deceleration uh, in the growth of that exposure base. So right now, uh, the prediction is that we avoid a recession, but growth rates do slow to less than 1% or 1.5% uh, over the next several quarters. 
All right. Uh, the generally accepted definition of a recession is two successive quarters with negative real GDP growth. That's, that, that is not a hard and fast rule, uh, but the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is literally across the river uh, from here, uh, is uh, the, the arbiter of that. Uh, and so uh, we actually had a recession uh, that didn't meet that definition um, at the onset of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so economic growth after ending last year at a blazing 7%, the fastest since the 1980s, uh, will see some deceleration. So this is the path of interest rates, again, expected to begin uh, today uh, as the Federal Reserve uh, begins to somewhat aggressively increase interest rates uh, through the remainder of this year and into uh, next year. So this is short-term interest rates. Uh, and so this is actually, to some degree, this is designed to slow down the economy, but we'll talk about this a little bit later on. For long-tailed lines like workers' compensation, uh, this isn't entirely a negative in the sense that, <clears throat> in the sense that there's the opportunity to earn more uh, investment income uh, for, uh, for insurers. And that's been a problem over the past, uh, really since the financial crisis. So, the labor markets have been really shook up, of course, uh, as a result of, of, of the pandemic. Uh, there are apparently jobs, jobs everywhere, wages are up. So where have all the workers gone? Are they coming back? What are they doing today? How has the labor market fundamentally changed? Well, this is the number of um, workers uh, in the economy, uh, non-farm workers. And uh, we had reached a peak in February of 2020 of 152.5 million workers. Within the span of 60 days, 22 million jobs were lost. 22 million jobs. Never before in U.S. history had that many jobs been lost that quickly. The unemployment rate went from 3.5% to 14.8% in a span of weeks. Uh, and so, but you can see we've been gradually uh, earning those jobs back over time. And so today, still, however, two years later, we are 2.1% million jobs short of where we were prior to COVID. So people are demanding a record amount of stuff, sitting there on Amazon, and now traveling, doing all kinds of things, buying cars, buying bigger houses, and so forth. But there are 2.1 million fewer workers in the workforce who have to produce all of these sorts of things. That's another component of the prescription uh, to inflation out there. Why are people staying out of the workforce? Why are there problems with RTW return to work? We've heard a lot about child care issues, fear of contracting COVID, caring for others, um, the, imp the incentives of extended or expanded unemployment benefits, strong household balance sheets. Remember, we helicoptered $6 trillion onto their balance sheets over a span of a year. A lot of that is still sitting in their bank accounts. Uh, and retirements, people exiting the labor force for retirement. So here you saw what happened to unemployment. Um, from 3.5% all the way up to, this is on a quarterly basis, it was 13%, 14.8% uh, uh, in uh, April of 2020. That's when it peaked. Uh, so this far exceeds what we saw during the, the uh, financial crisis. But during the financial crisis, look at what happened. It took years and years and years for the unemployment rate to get back to what it was prior to the beginning of the start of the financial crisis. We've really gotten back to where we are. We're very close. Unemployment rate now, last month, was 3.8%. So we're essentially where we were prior to COVID. So the labor market is tight as a drum uh, today. Uh, and, but people haven't come back into the labor force. So the labor force participation rate, uh, which dropped in April of 2020 to about 60%, the lowest that we had seen since 1971, all right, uh, it's only come part way back. So as of last month, the labor force participation rate, 62.3%, uh, but still, uh, that's below what it was uh, prior to COVID, where it was over uh, 60, uh, 63%. So we've got a ways to go, and it's unclear to me if we can actually get back to where we were prior to COVID. So again, millions of people still out of the labor force. This tightness in the labor force is pushing up labor costs in a, in a pretty significant way. Uh, so we could see labor costs now, uh, this is on a quarterly basis, the most recent data, the employment cost index, rising to, at their fastest pace that we've seen uh, in about 20 years. So they aren't unprecedented increases in the cost of labor, but it is the fastest we've seen uh, in about 20 years. So uh, this is, again, yet another, uh, uh, this is influencing inflation, but I wouldn't say that we're in a kind of 1970s style wage 
uh, price spiral right now. Um, now, if we dig a little deeper into why people are maybe staying out of the workforce and we think about the intersection of that with COVID, uh, what we see here is that the federal government um, actually collects data on why people uh, miss work. Uh, and there are a variety of uh, pieces of data that they collect. One of them is that they're sick. And if you look at this data that go all the way back to 1976, so we've got about, uh, you know, we've got uh, 45 years worth of data here. Um, what we see is that uh, in January of this year, due to Omicron, we had about 3.6 million people um, were out of work on average on a given day in January as a result of Omicron, okay, uh, which almost seems so long ago now, it was not that long ago. Uh, that was down to about 1.6 million in February. Uh, and during April of 2020, the original COVID peak, it was about 2 million people were out uh, because they claimed uh, to be ill. Believe it or not, the previous peak was all the way back in January of 1978, unbelievably, due to the Russian flu. You can't make that up. Uh, uh, the, uh, we have a very different Russian flu uh, today, um, but the Russian flu back in 1978, prior to that, um, about 1.9 million people uh, out in a given day. Of course, uh, the labor force was much smaller then, so it was, it was pretty substantial. Uh, now, uh, so, so but hopefully we're getting past that, people out because they are sick. So it's clear that jobs are hard to fill. If you are a small employer today, uh, this, these data are from the National Federation of Independent Businesses in blue. Uh, this is business owners who indicate that uh, it's hard to fill a job. And the, the index here corresponds to the left-hand side, 48%. So nearly half of business owners say it is really hard to fill jobs uh, these days. And again, you know that. You see the help wanted signs everywhere. Uh, but you see the labor force participation rate in red among prime age workers, uh, okay, these are people uh, around the ages of like 25 to 54, remains depressed at about 82.2% versus 83. So there are hundreds of thousands of people in their prime working years uh, who remain out of the workforce. Not just people who edged into retirement early, people who are in their prime working years. Now, if we look at the number of unemployed persons per job opening, so you can think about this as how many unemployed people are looking for jobs. Back in the peak of the financial crisis, late 2009, there were seven people looking for a job for every one job opening. And it took years for the labor markets to absorb these people. Uh, during, prior to COVID, uh, there were, uh, we had a labor shortage. Uh, there were uh, fewer workers, there were about 0.8 workers uh, for every one job opening. That shot up to about five workers looking for a job for every one opening in the immediate aftermath of COVID. But today, look at where we are. Today, there are just 0.6 job seekers, six-tenths of a human being looking for every one job out there. You can kind of flip that around, and you can say there are almost two empty jobs uh, for every job seeker uh, that, uh, that exists. And so the labor market's very, very tight. And we can dissect... Um, who is and who, who's gotten out of the labor force and who's gotten back in? If we look at gender, <clears throat> so we've got the overall labor force participation rate in yellow, the middle line here. Uh, if we look at males, males have a higher labor force participation rate. There's nothing new about that. Uh, uh, but what we see is that um, males are still down a uh, one full percentage point in terms of their labor force participation. And females are down 1.3 points. Uh, compared to their pre-COVID labor force participation rate. And so this validates something we've been hearing, is that the <clears throat> impact of COVID has impacted uh, uh, female workers more than it has impacted men. And there's a lot of reasons for that, including the burden of taking care of children uh, who've been home from school uh, or taking care of other individuals in the family uh, who become ill. <clears throat> now, uh, if we uh, take a look at prime age workers, so these are people you would think should be in the labor force, okay? Uh, this is the green line right here. Uh, the overall is in yellow. These are, these are people, uh, both genders, age 25 to, uh, 60, to, uh, to 54. And again, the prime age uh, labor force participation rate is nearly a point below what it was prior to COVID. So even people in their prime working age have not returned to work. If you dissect it even more, who's come back into the work more quickly than anybody else? Believe it or not, it's the youngest workers. 
from the age of about 17 to 25. The youngest workers have come roaring back into the labor force faster uh, than anybody else. What about people who are what we call discouraged, okay? What is a discouraged worker? Okay, this is people who've been searching for work so long in vain that they actually drop out of the labor force. The government doesn't even include you in the unemployment statistics anymore at this point. Uh, and at the peak of the Great Recession, we had 1.3 million people who became so exasperated by the evaporation of their job prospects that they dropped out of the labor force entirely. Uh, that number slowly drifted downward. And then, of course, it shot back up during uh, COVID. But it only shot back up to about 700,000. Uh, but today, we're at about 393,000. So we are approaching where we were prior to COVID. So we would like to get the number of discouraged workers, again, these are people who just feel there's no place in the economy for them, to get them back into the labor force. And the lowest that number's ever been uh, is around uh, just over 200,000 or so. But again, just prior to COVID, uh, it was around 300,000. So I, uh, <coughs> assuming the economy doesn't become completely unhinged, I think we'll get down to about 350 uh, by the middle part of this year. So that's good news. People are working more hours. Those people who are in the labor force today are working hard. Part of that means working longer hours, and that's what's happening. So average weekly hours of work for private sector workers uh, is the longest we've seen, at least uh, the highest we've seen uh, in the last at least 15 years or so uh, after dropping during COVID. But uh, we're demanding more. Uh, obviously, with a shortage of workers, people are being asked to work more hours, and they are, they are responding to that, and, and thankfully uh, they are. So that's how, in part, we are making up for the people who haven't re-entered the labor force. Those who are there are working more days, more hours, uh, and, and making up for that deficit. Um, <clears throat> it is also true that the people who remained in the workforce are making more money, and that's good news, and they deserve to. Uh, so uh, we have seen an acceleration in wage inflation. There's a little blip there during COVID. It's a, it seems a little strange. Did everybody get a raise during COVID? What wound up happening initially is a lot of low-wage workers lost their jobs, retail, restaurant, those sorts of things, hospitality. And so what was left in the labor force were higher-wage workers. Uh, so the average, the, the numbers uh, during the, mid, the height of COVID were based on a workforce uh, that was proportionally more skewed towards higher-wage workers. That's what explains that little blip. Uh, but it is the case that the trajectory of wage increases has increased, uh, has accelerated uh, in the wake of COVID, uh, worker shortages, uh, and so forth. And we've heard a lot about a lot of companies increasing wages, Amazon, and so forth, uh, to retain workers. So here's what's happened in terms of the average hourly wage in the United States. From 3% in the couple of years before COVID uh, to nearly 5% in 2020 to 4.2% uh, uh, last year. So this will probably decelerate a little bit uh, as we get through time, but it's not going to get back to where it was 2, 2.5% two um, without uh, a, a recession um, anytime, anytime soon. So that's good news for workers, and a lot of this has gone to lower wage workers, at least for the first two years of COVID. There's some sign right now that this is skewing a little bit towards uh, other types of workers, but if you look at, at this top bar here, who's getting Who's getting the wage increases, the biggest wage increases? The blue line shows year over year, February 22 to February 21. Leisure and hospitality workers, people who work in hotels like this. People who really, really took it on the chin during COVID because groups like us weren't here uh, for two years. Okay, these are the people who serve you at Starbucks, the people who serve you at your favorite restaurant. Uh, they uh, are getting, I think quite deservedly so, uh, uh, very strong wage increases. Um, uh, people in some very high uh, wage industries like information hadn't really, seemed, uh, hadn't really seen large increases um, on a year-over-year -year basis, but in the last three months, uh, they've seen some acceleration uh, in their wages. So again, uh, good news is a lot of uh, lower wage workers have seen uh, sharp increases. Overall, what does this mean for the exposure base of workers' compensation payrolls well, we saw a very sharp drop in payrolls, not surprisingly, during the pandemic. We saw, uh, we saw uh, hundreds of billions of dollars drop out of the, uh, out of the payroll 
uh, 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 payrolls in, in the United States in the midst of COVID, about $600 billion uh, a plunge. Uh, we had seen a, a similar sort of a plunge uh, back during the financial crisis, but the plunge was, in percent terms was even larger uh, during COVID. But it's grown back. And look how rapidly payrolls have grown in the United States. So within uh, two or three quarters uh, from COVID's trough, uh, we had seen payrolls fully recover in the United States. Uh, they probably weren't where they would have been, but I'd say right about now, by the end of 2020, 2021 20, or early 2022, payrolls are where they would have been if COVID had never happened. In fact, the U.S. economy today, meaning the first quarter of 2022, is basically where it would have been if COVID had never happened. That's how much ground we have actually made up. So payroll, so non-farm payroll growth last year was an astonishing 10%. Uh, I don't know where in history I could go to find a comparable number to that. So if we look at the relationship between payroll, you would think that as payroll goes up, workers' comp uh, uh, premiums written will go up kind of uh, abs you know, in a linear fashion with it. That's not what happens. Uh, so this shows wage and salary disbursements, basically payrolls in blue. Uh, and you can see that for the last 30 years. Uh, and what you see is uh, the workers' comp uh, net written premiums is like all over the place. It generally is going up, but it's all over the place. Why is it all over the place? Because ultimately, workers' comp premiums written, yes, they are a function of the payroll exposure, but they're also a function of the rate that is being charged. Okay, so we've had hard markets and soft markets, uh, and that's what causes some of these uh, oscillations there. So over the very long a uh, path of history, workers' comp premiums written will follow payrolls, uh, but uh, payrolls has a, is, is much more predictable uh, than is uh, workers' comp premiums written. Because again, that is a function of the competitive rate environment uh, that's out there. But uh, all of that being said, what we should expect is very, very uh, with, with neutral, in a neutral rate environment, we would expect fairly robust uh, workers' comp premium growth over the next uh, couple of years. Now, uh, more evidence uh, in terms of uh, what's happened in the labor market, uh, how extraordinary it's been. This is the, what they call the quits rate that comes out of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. We're hearing a lot about the great resignation out there. So we're going to talk about the great resignation. How real is it? This is something that two years ago we didn't understand. Two years ago, people were clamoring to try to find any job they could as they were experiencing 22 million, 22 million layoffs throughout the economy, the loss of 22 million jobs. Never could we have imagined in March of 2020 when people were losing their jobs left and right that starting about a year after that, people would start to leave their jobs voluntarily in droves. And so what we saw is the quits rate dove. It plummeted during the COVID recession, and then it, it came back to where it was prior to COVID. And look, the quits rate soared to its highest levels ever, where about 3% of the labor force is churning uh, in any given month. These are the most recent data, which are for January of 2022. Now, if we look at the quits rate uh, by month and compare various years, now this is again a spaghetti chart, but all you have to really pay attention is, so what is this showing? This is showing the number of people who quit their jobs by month every year from 2021 all the way back to the year 2001. So there's 20 years of data here, but don't try to you know, look at all the, look at just the gold line on top. Okay, uh, so for almost all of last year, the quits rate in 2021 is just, you know, heads above any other year in the last 20 years. So something is going on. Uh, the quits rates were actually kind of elevated prior to COVID. Those are the top several lines right there, 28 and 2019. But during the financial crisis, people didn't quit their job. They stopped quitting their jobs the quits rate descended to record low levels during the financial crisis. That's what you would expect. We had completely the opposite effect this time around. Very, very interesting. And you can see the quit rates, uh, which are highest in the, on the right-hand side in kind of the brighter gold colors, correspond very, very, you know, almost perfectly, of course, with the higher rates. Uh, the hiring rates uh, are in blue. 
So uh, anybody who quits is quickly absorbed because businesses desperately uh, need them. These two charts are pretty much mirrors of one another. Someone quits, they get hired somewhere else. But of course, some people have quit and never come back into the labor force. And we'll talk about that in a minute. We can also you know, look at the unemployment rate, uh, which is uh, highest in the darker colored states, lowest in the lighter colored states. Uh, this is as of December of last year in job openings. Again, very, very uh, strong correlation here. The darker states for job openings correspond to the lighter states uh, for the unemployment rate. Uh, so uh, you, know, you do notice some states, of course, that have higher unemployment rates than others. States like New York, states like California, states like uh, Nevada, states that uh, Illinois that have had, um, you know, quite frankly, more draconian uh, shutdown measures and, sh and so forth uh, during uh, the pandemic. Uh, but something else is happening here in terms of the labor force. There are some people, yes, a lot of people are quitting and getting jobs somewhere else. There are people who are quitting and never coming back in to the labor force. So what's happening? Uh, if we look at the number of retirements uh, in, in the United States, what we see is the number of retirements from uh, starting with January of 2020 going through uh, the third quarter of 2021, which is the most recent data, uh, what we see is that it is the top line is those aged 65 to 74. That's where we've seen the sharpest acceleration in terms of the number of, of retirements. These are the younger retirees, people who might have kept working in their, their mid or late 60s, but instead have kind of withdrawn from the labor force maybe a little bit earlier than they would have. There's even been an uptick of those 75 uh, and older a little bit, but it's not all that much. Those 55 to 64, it's relatively flat. So it is a bit of a myth to say that there are a lot of people who are 55 and 60 who are dropping out of the labor force. That's not really it. It's the younger, the youngest retirees. Uh, those who sit right around 65, 66, 67, those who might stay in a few more years, those are the ones who are dropping out the soonest. So, uh, you know, and we can talk about why that might happen. Uh, but uh, if we take a look at this, what we see is something very different. What typically happens during a recession is people say, I can't afford to retire now. Okay, I need to stay in and work a couple of more years. That's not what has happened this time. So, in a completely complete twist of history, we've actually seen people say, oh, there's a recession, I'll leave. Okay, why is that? How can people do that? Well, in part because household balance sheets have been relatively strong, people got a lot of uh, COVID relief money, uh, such things as their home prices are relatively high. Back in the financial crisis, your home price probably cratered by about 25%, so you didn't feel as confident. Who's the most likely to have dropped out of the labor force over the past two years? Obviously, older people, uh, um, and according to uh, the, the Pew Research Center, older, white, college educated, and from the Midwest. Okay, that means those are people who are the best financially prepared, in some sense, uh, to drop out of the labor force. But statistically, the Midwest, part of the country that had a, a bit more of a, a difficult time. So where are we today? Of all adults uh, aged 55 plus, for the first time, to my knowledge, in US history, more than half are now retired, 55 plus. Half of all Americans 55 plus are not in the labor force anymore. Okay, that's, that's a pretty astounding uh, number. And so we've seen the 65 to 74. Uh, we've, seen, uh, we've seen the um, uh, number of people, the, the proportion of people in the labor force go from 64% in that age group. Okay, we've seen it. Uh, sorry, the proportion who are retired go from 64% to almost 67%. So that's a pretty big uh, increase if you take a look at that. Another thing that's not talked about a lot that's going to affect the ability to grow in a line like workers' compensation is population growth in the United States. The U.S. population growth last year was 0.1%, the smallest population growth in, uh, since the Great Depression. In other words, we're not making new workers in the United States. We're not making babies. Okay, which means we're not making the workers of the future. And we're not allowing them to come through the borders in, in a way uh, that has a meaningful impact on population growth in the United States. So states like Massachusetts lost a half of 1% of their population uh, last year. New York, 1.6%. California, 0.7%. Who's getting it? Mostly states in the southeast, states like Texas, and states in the, uh, in the mountain region. I live in South Carolina now after living 20 years in New York, 
uh, and houses are sprouting up everywhere like weeds in some place like uh, South, South Carolina. Uh, you don't see that kind of a thing happening uh, in, in the northeastern part of the United States. So, where, so the, the, the growth opportunities for insurers, quite frankly, are in the southeast, south central part of the country, the mountain part of the country. And this is a major change in the demographics uh, of the United States. Uh, and yes, there can, uh, we'll have to, are, are people going to begin to reproduce at a higher rate uh, after COVID? I'm seeing some, hand, some people are nodding out here, so they have some firsthand knowledge about this. But uh, I said, sir, I want to talk to you later because you were nodding very aggressively there. Uh, so, um, uh, and are we going to have some change in immigration policy? We'll, we'll have to see. What people don't understand, actually, in the United States historically, one of the greatest drivers of economic growth has actually been population growth. Population growth uh, is, is tied with uh, uh, is greater economic growth uh, over many, many, many decades uh, in, this, in this country. So uh, very quickly, you know, so how was this overall industry done uh, during COVID? Well, the industry actually entered COVID strong, stable, sound, secure, the overall PNC industry, and actually workers' compensation in particular, as I'll show you in a minute, is the best performing of all major property casualty lines. It went into COVID stronger than any major property casualty line, uh, and it'll exit it strong as well. But the industry has been seeing declining profits and profitability over the past several years. Um, in part due to things like high catastrophes, but also lower interest rates, which has been reducing investment income. And the industry did take a hit during uh, the early days of COVID. The industry's surplus, its capital, its capacity, dropped by about 9% in the first quarter of 2021, but it's reached new all-time record highs after that. Uh, so again, so there's a real testimony uh, to the resilience of this industry. When you were sitting in your positions two years ago, you were wondering what was going to happen to the workers' comp industry, okay? You're gonna think it's gonna be overrun by COVID claims, those sorts of things. We'll talk about that, and you're gonna hear a lot about that during the, the conference. But if we look at the industry's underwriting performance during COVID, in other words, how much money we paid out relative to what we took in, roughly speaking, the combined ratio uh, in 2020, you really wouldn't notice anything had gone on there. Uh, COVID had a number of impacts. COVID actually had a depressing impact on claim activity overall across the industry. But at the same time, there were near record catastrophes, which sort of offset that. So it was roughly uh, a wash. In terms of premium growth, however, the industry has seen a lot of oscillation. So uh, the predictions prior to COVID is the industry was going to see about 4% growth in 2020. That actually saw growth of 1.8% that year. So COVID cut the industry's premium growth in half. And a lot of that had to do with the evaporation of the payroll exposure base, or a big chunk of it, uh, in, uh, in workers' comp. And I'll show you that data in a minute. But what I've said time and time again, and this is why what's happening uh, today in terms of inflation and what's happened with e Ukraine and uh, higher energy prices and the probability increasing of a recession is very, very important. This chart in blue shows the industry's direct rate and premium growth in blue, and it shows year-over-year -year GDP growth in orange. It shows how closely correlated this industry's growth fortunes are with the overall economy. It didn't used to be that way in the 1970s. The industry was far more cyclical during that period of time. Today, it is much uh, more closely, its fortunes, its growth, are much more closely associated with the fortunes of the overall economy. So if we enter a recession, we would expect to see workers' comp premiums written uh, fall along with that, just as it did, uh, just as they did uh, during, uh, during uh, the, the, the brief COVID recession. And so during COVID, what happened? If we look at the, some major uh, uh, lines of insurance, what we see is that workers' compensation saw the biggest drop in percent terms in premium of all major, major property casualty lines. It was down 10% or about $4.2 billion. Uh, I believe this is just for, um, this doesn't include monopolistic state funds and so forth. Um, uh, and the dollar amount was roughly the same as personal auto, but for personal auto it was less than 2% because personal auto is, much is about four times the size of the workers' compensation line. Uh, so workers' comp was the most impacted from a revenue standpoint of all lines. And in fact, um, but there were projections that it could be even worse 
uh, in April, May of 2020, Willis Towers Watson uh, issued a, 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 put out an analysis about various lines of insurance and how their revenues would be impacted, how premiums would be impacted. They said that workers' comp premiums could fall by 125 to 25%. Okay, so it turned out it was 10%. Uh, but fortunately, it was not 25%. They also predicted that losses in the workers' compensation line could reach as high as $90 billion. $90 billion. Now, that assumes an out-of-control pandemic uh, and very broad presumption requirements. Um, but nevertheless, $90 billion would have made uh, the loss to the workers' compensation system larger than any natural disaster ever to have occurred in the history of the planet in terms of insured losses. So, thankfully, uh, we dodged uh, that, that bullet. Uh, very quickly, again, what's going on today? The Federal Reserve raising interest rates today, reversing, beginning the reversal of what it began two years ago to offset the impacts of the pandemic. Insurers have been seeing their investment income decline as interest rates have been falling. Higher interest rates are all else equal are better for insurers. Uh, again, earning more, in, uh, earning uh, more on, the, on the funds that are sitting there uh, is to the benefit of any large institutional investor. And all else equal, all else equal, uh, rates have to be higher in a low interest rate environment than they do when interest rates uh, are are uh, are higher. And so we can see what's happened to the industry's investment portfolio. Look at this. Ever since the financial crisis, and then last year really falling off a cliff, last year the return on the industry's uh, investment portfolio uh, on invested assets was 2.6% through the third quarter. This is the lowest number since 1961. All right, so only very, very slowly will higher interest rates begin to reverse this. But on net, this is a, a benefit for the industry. And you can see how interest rates have been trending down really for the past 30 years, more or less, uh, but really plunged during COVID. And you can see have been coming back up a bit more recently. So that's where we are today. Uh, the interest rate environment is such. But the interest rate environment does not suggest that markets expect uh, interest rates to skyrocket like they did back in um, longer term interest rates like they back in the 1970s. You don't go out today and get, a, as I mentioned, a 30 year mortgage for 18%. You can get it for something less than 4%. So the expectation is for interest rates to basically get back largely to where they were prior to COVID. A lot is being made of this, but it's more of a normalization. Bringing interest rates back by 2023, roughly to where they were prior to COVID. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to be very careful about how you do it. Um, now, in, the, in terms of workers' comp, I had mentioned to you workers' comp has been the best performing line. Let me illustrate what I mean uh, right here. Look at workers' compensation. This is the combined ratio, what we pay out relative to what we take in from 2019 um, with an estimate through 2022. And we see combined ratios in workers' comp, high 80s, low 90s during this period of time. This is basically lower than just about anything else other than uh, uh, Inland Marine, a very, very different type of uh, coverage, which is perennially uh, profitable. Uh, but so this is, uh, so workers' compensation has done very well. If I were speaking at this conference uh, about 12 years ago, which maybe I had been, okay, uh, uh, the workers' comp line was the least profitable. It was about 115 combined ratio. We were paying out a buck 15 for every dollar uh, we took in. And so here you can see that right here. So the remarkable transformation of workers' compensation has been from one of the absolute worst performing lines in 2010 and 2011 to within a span of eight or nine years to having turning in the best results in recorded history in this line of insurance. So that's a dramatic uh, turnaround. Uh, what we see is, in fact, workers' comp rate changes are basically flat, all right, uh, right now, whereas most other commercial lines are seeing very large increases today led by cyber, okay? Uh, umbrella, what's umbrella? This is... Um, uh, covers for high-level liability losses, if you're not familiar with that. Directors and officers, employment practices, these kinds of things. Workers' comp rates are very stable today. Now, um, uh, uh, some additional uh, great data to share uh, about what's been going on during COVID. Um, uh, a lot of analyses uh, going on associated with that today. But if we look at, you know, the, the COVID claims that actually occurred uh, starting in 2020, uh, what we can see is that about 11% of claims in the workers' comp system in 2020 were related to uh, COVID, uh, 
okay? But in terms of the dollars actually being paid out, those are the right, whether actually paid or whether they were incurred, um, you know, it's only about uh, three, three and a half percent or so. So we had a fair number of claims, but in terms of actual dollars, uh, they weren't that momentous in terms of, of, their, of their severity. Uh, in terms of claim counts, this is a very, very interesting uh, data as well. If we look at um, the proportion of claims that were associated with, uh, with COVID versus non-COVID, what we see is, for instance, I mean, it's, it, the, if you look at a state like Montana, only about 1% of, uh, of workers' comp claims were related to COVID. The median state was 7%. But in a state like Kentucky, it was 29%. What explains this? Uh, my view is this is, this is, a, is, is a result of the, the presumption requirements, which were much broader in a state like Kentucky uh, or a state like in Illinois, uh, which had much broader presumption uh, requirements that were implemented um, during, during COVID. I think that explains... Uh, most, although not all, of, of the difference here. And if we look at the losses paid out, uh, you see uh, COVID-19 related losses uh, in the workers' comp system were very, very low in, uh, in a variety of states on the left-hand side here, led by Alabama being the lowest. You've got New Jersey, District of Columbia over on the right-hand side. So again, I think presumption requirements explain uh, a, good, uh, a good part of of this, so a lot of great data that we'll, uh, we'll be able to analyze for, for many years to come. So let me just summarize here, and I'd be happy to take a, a couple of questions in the, in, the, in the number of minutes that we have remaining. Um, the good news, the very broad news, is the property casualty insurance industry, the workers' comp industry in particular, remains strong, stable, sound, and secure. That's how we entered the crisis. That's how we managed through the crisis and on the other end of this crisis. That's where we are today. So, but it seems we go from one crisis to the next. Uh, we go from COVID to now an inflationary environment. Um, but workers' comp, as I mentioned, remains among the best performing of all property casualty lines. And that's something very much to be proud of, whether you're an insurer or you're someone who manages claims. Whatever your role is, you have an important role at making sure that uh, the outcomes are as best they can be and that this is being done in a cost-effective and efficient manner. And, and so workers' compensation really, I think, is... Uh, um, in, in, in some ways, uh, the, the shining star of the property casualty insurance uh, industry today. Um, labor markets, very, very tight. Uh, uh, and rising wages implies likely rising indemnity severities in workers' compensation. Um, <clears throat> millions of workers remain out of the labor force. Will they return? I think some will. I, increasingly, I think a consensus is that a lot won't. And so what we're going to wind up with is having to improve productivity in the United States. We have to do more with less. And you see a lot of that uh, with increased use of, of robotics and artificial intelligence technologies or everywhere you go. You can go to McDonald's nowadays and you have to use a kiosk. You don't talk to a human being, whatever. These are ways that businesses are trying to cope uh, with the labor shortages and become more efficient uh, in the years ahead. Um, surging inflation, surprise, surprise, is now the biggest threat to the economy. Two years ago, when we were uh, uh, you know, right in the earliest stages of COVID, um, we never would have uh, imagined that. Okay? Uh, but here we are today, uh, being led by energy, commodities, goods, and services will lag. So I think one of the biggest wild cards, as I, you know, I, I leave you here today, is to be able to think about what will happen to uh, the cost of medical services, medical inflation in general, over the next 12 months? So when you reconvene here in Boston a year from now, I suspect you'll have seen more pressure exerted on that side of the equation, on the services side, including the medical side. Um, the geopolitical turmoil adds to a, uh, some uncertainty here, um, oil leading the way, of course. Uh, and what this does is lead to a higher probability of, again, what you might refer to as a hard landing, which is exactly what I had when I got in four hours late at Logan Airport last night. Uh, but um, uh, I won't get into the details of that, but they had to replace the windshield. There was too much gas on the plane. Too much gas, you know, uh, uh, those kinds of things. And, uh, but it means the probability of a recession is growing. Is it 
imminent? No. Are the odds against it? Yes. That's the good news. But is there an opportunity for a policy error here? Uh, and that policy error meaning raising interest rates too far, too fast, too aggressively so that the economy just sort of tips into a recession? Yes, that is a concern. So that uh, I don't want to be Jay Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, right now. He has one of the toughest jobs uh, in America, and everybody will blame him. Um, and so higher interest rates, uh, yes, modestly so, uh, will benefit long-tailed lines like workers' compensation. So uh, that does conclude my comments. This presentation I know is being made available uh, by WCRI. Uh, you can find this presentation and many others at uh, my website at USC Risk Center. Uh, dot com, or you can follow me on Twitter. Well, I'll usually uh, post a link uh, to Twitter after something like this uh, comes out. So right now, uh, first, I want to thank you for your time, your attention. I'd be very happy uh, to take a couple of uh, questions out here. Thank you very much. Oh, there's, there's a, a microphone. Yeah, come um, up to the mics, folks. Okay. Uh, you've addressed the situation and the economic fallout from the war with Russia and Ukraine, and it's very energy independent. Or dependent. What would the impact be from a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, which is also rumored that, as a possibility. Ooh, some pleasant thoughts here, huh? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, okay, my, uh, mind you, I've never worked in the U.S. State Department, um, but uh, at any rate, it would, um, my view, it would be worse, okay? Why would it be worse? Taiwan is a much more important trading partner uh, to us than, than Ukraine is or than Russia is. A conflict between China and Taiwan is many, many, many orders of magnitude worse for our economy. Uh, and for the global economy, uh, and, it, and not only just in terms of you know, how much of global GDP Russia and Ukraine represent versus Taiwan and China, uh, the sorts of, uh, we are very dependent on China uh, and Taiwan right now for a lot of technology related devices and so forth. So for our everyday, um, you know, uh, if you wanna use an iPhone or we need chips for our cars or what have you, the effects would be far, far worse. So you are seeing, in the United States, we're recognizing some of those vulnerabilities. We're seeing announcements of tens of billions of dollars of chip foundries, for instance, uh, to be built in the United States, places like Ohio and Intel, companies like this announcing. So uh, I, I think this whole process, what we're seeing with Russia, what we're seeing with the Ukraine, which are big exporters of, say, wheat, um, uh, uh, which you can, um, you know, there are many other places that can, that, where we can substitute that for, uh, that would be much more difficult. So, I, to, long story, it would be far, far worse. And so I think uh, in the United States, Europe, and I also think China is going to be taking a look at this and thinking, well, would this be as easy as we thought it, it would? And Taiwan will be looking at this as well and think we want to make sure that we're prepared. So uh, God forbid we're looking at that scenario, but there will be a lot of saber rattling, but hopefully we'll, we'll avoid that. We'll take a step back from the brink. What sectors in particular do you think would be most impacted? economically. Uh, I guess manufacturing uh, you've mentioned, but... Uh, yeah, uh, te technology would absolutely be, uh, would, would be one of them. I, I think, um, uh, I, I think the, the, the disruption in terms of technology and then, uh, yeah, everyday manufactured goods that tend to come from China, very, very uh, disruptive. But I think that, uh, you know, we're entering kind of a, I don't know, an, an echo of the Cold War in a sense that the Cold War, the reason why we never had a nuclear war with Russia because of the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. There it was kind of nuclear annihilation. Uh, I, I think that we would be looking at economic annihilation um, on both sides of the Pacific if we wound up with that, with that situation. And I think that hopefully both sides will recognize that and while there'll be some saber rattling and jostling for who has control of, of this, that, and the other part of, of, of you know, the Western Pacific, um, so long as, as we can avoid an all-out conflict, uh, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll be okay. But that, that's, a, that's a very, very scary uh, scenario. Right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, by the way, I'm Gary Anderberg, writer and publisher of the Gallagher Bassett Journal. I think some of the folks here are my faithful readers. Uh, I have two questions, but they're both about the same thing, and that is what is behind the numbers. When I look at 13% and 7.5% inflation comparison, the basis upon which inflation is calculated has changed dramatically in the intervening yeah. years. What does that comparison look like if we try to normalize yeah. the actual underlying factors that all roll up 
to that number, yeah. number one. And number two, when we talk about labor force participation, I was struck by something I didn't hear this time that we talked about and talked about and talked about back before the pandemic hit, and that is what is the contribution, what is the place of, how are we counting the gig economy in mm -hmm. these numbers? Because that has an impact, and that has proven very hard to account for. So those are my two questions, yeah. both about where the numbers come from. Uh. You know, John, next time invite people here who ask easy questions. Uh, no, it's, uh, in terms of the first one, you're absolutely right. In terms of, you know, the, the weights that go into the consumer price index are constantly adjusted. So back in 1978 or so, 1980, uh, energy accounted for a much larger component of the consumer price index than it does today. So we are actually uh, less dependent, we are less dependent on, uh, uh, let me put it this way, uh, in order to generate one dollar of GDP in the United States, it takes much less of an energy input than it did back in 1978. So that means that if we wind up back with hundred dollar uh, a barrel of you know hundred dollars per barrel of oil or even higher, uh, it should have much less of an effect on the economy than it did back in 1978. And then you add to that the fact that we have domestic energy resources that we simply didn't have. Uh, back in the 1970s, early 1980s. That means an energy price shock or surge uh, uh, on its own um, should not be sufficient to knock the economy into a recession the same way it did in the 1970s. Uh, if we kind of slide into a recession right now, it's not solely because of what's happening to, uh, uh, on, on the energy side. It's in part because we have not fully resolved our supply chain disruption issues, okay? Uh, and um, uh, I, I, would, I would consider that that would be the second, uh, th that would be kind of what, the straw that broke the camel's back that kind of forced us in, uh, into that type of situation. In terms of the labor force and the, the gig economy issue, which also didn't exist back, uh, for, for at least formally, to the extent that we're aware of it today, there have always been people who've, uh, you know, uh, worked under the table, so to speak. Uh, that's what we used to call it. So we formalize a lot of that now, and we call it the, uh, the, the, gig, the gig economy. And um, I, I would say that the role, uh, you know, the gig economy today has um, proven itself, I think, to be indispensable. Uh, there, uh, and even more so during the pandemic. Many people who lost their jobs during COVID, in fact, uh, you're, you're, you're making me think about that. Where did some of these two million people go who still aren't in the labor force? Some of them are in the, the gig economy and aren't being officially counted uh, there. Are they generating as much income as they used to? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but they are generating income in other ways in the sense that they've got more flexibility to take care of children, to take care of others in the family, to do other sorts of things. So you make a, a, an excellent point, I think, that um, that uh, I, I think our, our labor market woes would be amplified, quite frankly, if it weren't for the, the, uh, the, the gig economy. Many of you probably took an Uber or a Lyft uh, to get here. Uh, um, me, I, I'm, I guess I was a Luddite, I was too lazy, I went out to the regular taxi stand when I came uh, out from Lo Logan Airport. But nevertheless, you're absolutely right. And so um, I, I think that, uh, th that the tightness in the, in the labor market would be even worse if it were not for the important role that's being played in the gig economy. And that leads into this other consideration that we've heard over the last several years, even prior to COVID. Our gig workers, should they be considered employees along the lines of what uh, they want to do in California? Uh, or should they not be considered employees along the lines of what we see in, in most states? But thank you. There's Barry, and I'm not sure who was here first. Let's see. Barry, was here first. Uh, Barry, Barry, okay. Hi, Barry. Hi, Barry Lipton from NCCI. Good to see you in person again, You Bob. too, Barry. So uh, is there a, a long-term inflation rate, a concept of yeah. a mean that if there was a regression to the mean in, in the next decade, or is the fundamental world shifted so much that that isn't a useful idea? Yeah, uh, good, good point. You know, when I was back a, a baby economist and I was in training, yeah, we used to learn about uh, an, inf an inflation rate um, uh, that would, um, would be stable, but uh, you know, wouldn't lead to any kind of an acceleration. And, and uh, we used to think that was somewhere around uh, 4% <laughs> or so, uh, five, maybe even closer to 5% back in the, uh, in the mid to late 1980s. Uh, the Federal Reserve has as its target 2%. Uh, 
I, I think that that number might be a little bit ambitious in the sense that it might be a little bit too low in, in, in my view. Uh, and, and that I think that if I were Jay Powell and I were thinking about, okay, if I can thread this needle, where do I need to wind up? Okay, do I have to get it back to 2%? But to do that, I have to keep the un unemployment rate at 4.5% versus if I allow the inflation rate to be 25 or 3%, I can keep the unemployment rate maybe closer to 3.5%. Is that, is that sort of what you're... Yeah, well, you know, for a person of my generation, two, a target of 2% sounds really optimistic. Yeah, it, it does, yeah. it does. And I look back at some of the charts, and gee, even 3% didn't seem like a multi-decade average. It, it's, it's not. The, uh, if, however, if you were to go back the period prior to the 1970s, you'd actually see that... Uh, inflation was relatively low going back uh, to World War II and even back but uh, through the like Depression. Like 3%. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was lower, and interest rates were very low during that period. So the question is, is um, <clears throat> there are some people who have studied very long spans of history, and they believe that the, the, the 70s, early 80s is actually an aberration. Um, even if you go back over four or 500 years of history, in, in, in Europe they have data on interest rates going all the way back to the medieval period uh, in some cases. And generally speaking, uh, periods in which interest rates are sky high, like we saw uh, during the 70s and 80s, tend to be in, in aberration, at least in relatively stable economies. Thanks. Thanks, Barry. Uh, yeah? Thanks for the presentation, uh, Griffin Murphy, National Academy of Social Insurance. I think a lot of people think it's possible and even likely that we'll have another pandemic sometime in the next five to ten years. Do you think, in that case, we would see more presumptions in the future, or less presumptions, or how do you think states might respond? Yeah, so <laughs> one of these questions is, yeah, when will the next pandemic be? And is it going to be a baby pandemic or a full-blown pandemic? Um, and uh, we hadn't seen something along the lines of this in, in almost 100 years in the United States. And at, and at that point, you know, comparisons to, you know, if it happened in 20, 2120, you know, technology, everything would be different. But if we have another, um, <clears throat> I think what will happen is we will have uh, one of these um, some sort of virus, one form or another, will, uh, will rear its ugly head in the next 5, 10, 15 years, and everybody will dust off their 2020 playbooks uh, at, at that point. And, um, and so, it's a, I'm sorry, what was the, the, the actual question part, though? It was... How would you expect a similar impact on the industry in the future? Or how, uh, do you think... Oh, on problems? the industry? On the industry, and how would, do you think states would respond to this? Yeah, so on the industry, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, if we were to see literally something like COVID uh, um, happen again 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, when, it, when it's still fresh in our mind, I, I think we would deal with it uh, in, in a much better way than we did last time. I mean, this was very much a, a, learning, a learning experience. And um, it'll be a politically fraught process. There's no question about that. Uh, but I do think we probably learned a lot of lessons from this and that I, I think that the economy overall, uh, where we'd have a replay of this in the year 2040 or the year 2030 or something, we would, we would handle it much better than we did in the past. And yeah. for the states that use presumptions, do you think they would? Oh. Yeah, for the presumptions now, um, yeah, the presumption, I, I think states would be quick to, uh, re, to, uh, to, to re-implement presumption requirements. They would, they would broaden them. I think there's probably no, no question about that. I think that's something that would come right out of the playbook. Uh, there are a lot of things that come out of the playbook in terms of, like, how states uh, manage catastrophes, for instance, that affect uh, the, the property casualty insurance industry. This is something that is being inserted as a page into their, into their playbook for the future. Presumption requirements automatically expanded during a future pandemics. Maybe more quickly and even more liberally so. Great. Yeah. I appreciate Maybe. the optimism. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for, can we take one more question? Just go, one more? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Tom Winters. I'm uh, trained in infectious disease and occupational medicine. Uh, so uh, very insightful lecture. I'd love to be a student at USC uh, in your class. Thank, that's you're, not what my students always say, but thank you. Yeah. That's kind of you. That's. <laughs> no, you're, you're great. Uh, when you got to the presumption piece at the end, uh, I've done about 50, 60 medical record reviews and IMEs on people related to causation. 80, 90 percent weren't causally related to right. work. Right. When you apply epidemiologic criteria, prevalence and incidence in the community, uh, you find out that most of these occurred in the community. Right. They right. didn't occur at work. Right. So the presumption laws are great, you know, for essential workers, but they, they really don't uh, occur I've, at work because people are wearing PPE properly, donning, doffing. So. It's just, it's gotten a little bit, 
uh, too far down. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, you look at some states like Illinois and Kentucky, I mean, just the, the presumption re uh, requirements are extraordinary. At the same time, it looks like uh, when we look at the experience of the workers' comp uh, industry over the past two years, it does the, 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 the presumption requirement, the expansion didn't seem to blow up the system, fortunately. So that, that much is, is good news. Long COVID's coming. Yeah, oh, oh boy. On that positive note, let's see. Uh, uh, so, um, but thank you very much for your time, uh, your attention, and I wish you all the best of success at this conference and the remainder of the year. And then I wanted to, I wanted to ask, uh, 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 Kathy said she has to come up and make a few uh, announcements, right? Okay. Uh, first, thank join you. me by thanking Bob for Thank you very much. Thank you.